everyone, I'm Aparna, and on behalf of the Sarma Arts Foundation, I welcome you to Sarma Talks at the Asiatic Society. I would like to take a moment to introduce ourselves. Sarma Arts Foundation is a not-for-profit organization that has curated repository of art, artifacts, and living traditions from the Indian subcontinent. It was founded in 2015 by Mr. Paul Abraham, a Mumbai-based banker, history enthusiast, and arts patron. Our mission at Sarmaya is to make India's art, heritage, and culture more accessible and inspire young learners to discover their cultural inheritance through a critical and compassionate lens. We work on a hybrid programming model serving audiences both online and on the ground. I would like to now introduce our first speaker for today. Professor Nadeem Rezavi is a professor at Aligarh Muslim University and the author of many research publications, including Fatehpur Sikri Revisited. He is the secretary of the Indian History Congress and runs the Aligarh Society of History and Archaeology. Professor Rezavi. Well, good evening, uh, all the friends uh, who have assembled here. First of all, uh, I would uh, like to thank Sarmaya, especially uh, the person, the inspiration behind it, Paul Abraham, and uh, all the other members of the Sarmaya talk group uh, who made it a point to, I mean, hunt me out and invite me to come and deliver this uh, small talk to you. Uh, I would be confining my talk to certain uh, wall paintings. Uh, paintings which were done during the period which now must not be named in today's India. Uh, the entire subject of medieval Indian history is now I mean, on the way out, but still Today evening, both of us would be talking about that period. Uh, ornamenting the walls of imperial capital, Fatehpur Sikri and its surface decorations is actually a topic which I chose uh, for a specific reason. And that is because through this talk, I would like to establish what was the kind of milieu which prevailed during 16th, 17th century India. Uh, I would uh, be confining myself only to one part of it, and that is the part related with the paintings. Uh, before I start that, uh, just a brief introduction to what is Fatehpur Sikri itself. Fatehpur Sikri is today a fossilized town, once created by a man during whose lifetime itself it was abandoned as the capital. Uh, it survived as a township, but not as the imperial capital of the Mughals. From being an imperial capital, it turned into an economic center where merchants would be visiting for uh, you know, cultivation of indigo and for the carpet weaving. It flourished during the period of Jahangir. It flourished during the period of Shah Jahan as well. Not as uh, you know, a very important town, but still important enough that Shah Jahan too has left certain of his marks on this very city. And I would be trying to show some of the examples from one of the palaces which we were able to discover from his period, which one of the sources written during the reign of Shah Jahan, uh, Pachanama of Varis, uh, which is uh, yet to be published. It is in Persian, but in that Varis, the author of this Pachanama mentions that Shah Jahan ordered a palace to be built. The mere fact that Shah Jahan was 
making a palace means that the city was continuing, right? Now, but as I said that I won't be talking about the uh, city itself, but I would be paying attention only to the uh, one aspect of it, that is the aspect which has been highlighted uh, for us by the painters of the Mughal period. Uh, you know, there are two important works which have been done on painting. One by one of the scholars who was at Aligarh, S.P. Verma, Som Prakash Verma, and the other is A.K. Das. And both of them had, have written a large number of articles as well as books, and those interested uh, to uh, know what actually the Mughal paintings were, they should consult those two uh, uh, books, which are very, uh, I mean, uh, very well written and they would give you much information about the topic which I am going to speak. Among the painters, uh, most, uh, you know, uh, importance has been given for the Mughal period only on those who painted on paper. Now, those who painted on the paper, that is on the books, their works were known as miniatures, something which could be held in hand. But then, this whole process of Mughal miniatures actually started when Akbar gave orders for preparing a manus, uh, for, for preparing certain paintings which had to be hung on the walls of the palaces. So there are a large number of Mughal paintings which survive and which are quite large. They cannot be called as miniatures also. But the most neglected of all these paintings are what are known as surface decorations. Because along with the buildings of the Mughal period, even the paintings which once decorated those walls have also disappeared. Uh, one very peculiar feature uh, which resulted in Mughal school of painting was the fact that it was a collaborative work. In one single page of a manuscript, when something was being painted, a number of artists would be working together. For example, someone would be making the animals, the other drawing the trees, the other uh, uh, making the chehrae nami, the faces of those, you know, uh, 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 in this particular painting, and there would be separate people who would be applying color. So, one Mughal painting, I mean, there are paintings which uh, you would uh, be hearing about the, the paintings of Ustad Mansur. There were certain paintings done by individuals also. But the Mughal school of painting actually was a school where there was a collaborative work, where people of different traditions, religious, regional, social distinctions would be coming together. They would be of various ethnic origins. They would be Central Asians, they would be Iranians, Georgians, uh, for, uh, among the Indians there uh, uh, might be some who were Gujaratis, some were Kashmiris, some were Bengalis, so on and so forth. And also of various religions. Some of them belong to the class of the elites, they were nobles themselves. Some of them were of very lowly origin. But all these people would be sitting in one place, in work, one workshop and working on one single page and the result would be a beautiful miniature, say, of the Akbar Nama or the Babar Nama or the Padshah Nama. So, 
and it would be difficult for you to pinpoint whose work is this. Now, coming from different backgrounds, different trainings, different educations, they would be putting into this painting their own version. Right? Uh, so, what resulted was that the Mughal paintings were very different from, say, Central Asian paintings of Herat. They were very different from the Iranian school of painting. Because they might be inspired from the Iranians, but actually the man who was involved in giving the color or making the sketch of the face was an Indian. He did not know what was happening in Iran. The idea might have been given by the master painter that you have to make this, but the person who was trained in the same art as was the painter of Ajanta, it was that tradition that he was trying to introduce into this very page of uh, which was being created uh, for a royal manuscript. If you look at who were these painters, you would find that during the reign of Akbar, when the Mughal school of painting, Mughal school of art was established, both Hindu and Muslim, Shia and Sunni, Jains and Christians were part of the Mughal atelier. Now, if you look at the figures of the uh, you know, Hindu versus Muslim painters during the reign of Akbar, you know, they, uh, uh, everything cannot be told in a brief lecture, so I'll be just confining my, myself to certain aspects. Under Akbar, the ratio was 1 is to 26, uh, to 2.6. It's not 26. I mean, from far, that dot might not be appearing to you. 1 is to 2.6, where 1 is a Hindu and 2.6 is Muslim. And during the subsequent reigns, Jahangir, Shah Jahan, Aurangzeb, 1 is to 1. If there were 100 painters, 50 were Hindus, 50 were Muslims. Right? This was as far as their uh, you know, ratio between Muslims and non-Muslims, the major two communities uh, 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 the, uh, uh, was concerned. There were, as I said, people who were of the royal origin, members of the imperial household, there were certain princesses also who were, who were involved in this work, but then there were also lower class people. I'll give you an example that there were kahars, palanquin bearers, nakash, the, the caste of the painters, I mean, which is there in India. They are, they were considered to be shudras. Sangtaraj, stone cutters, those who used to carve on the stone, they would also, they were also involved in the making of paintings. So all type of people, from nobility down to the, what, in today's language, we would say schedule caste. They were all involved in making of these paintings. I'll give you an example of the Kahars under Akbar. Palanquin bearers who were, had no social position at all. Daswant was the most important. He is mentioned by Abul Fazal. Asi, Keshav, all three are non-Muslims and Ibrahim. He is also a kahar who is involved in the profession of painting. Now, Abul Fazal, the official historian of Akbar's period, has this to say as far as the Hindu painters in Akbar's court were concerned. Their pictures surpass our conception of things. Few indeed in the whole world are found equal to them. And why not? India is the country where, uh, you know, uh, such painters had produced works like Ajanta and Alora. 
So, I mean, they were the people who were actually uh, very well trained in their field of art and they were being recruited and Abul Fazal goes out of his way to uh, 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 praise their expertise. As I said, that although much work S.P. Verma and others have done on uh, the painters who were involved in making of the miniatures, but what is left out are paintings which are on the walls, surface decorations. Fortunately, we have one painting which survives perhaps from uh, Jahangir's period where uh, you know, you can see that there, there is a painter, an artist, he is making a portrait on the wall. And there are people who are standing uh, on the side, appreciating his art, whereas if you look at this level, these are uh, the people who are making the, uh, you know, the the color which was to be applied on the painting itself. These are the people who are making the color and the artist is drawing an image on the wall. Now if you look at the paintings which survive on the walls of the Mughal palaces and buildings, there are three types. Fresco bono, stucco, and fresco secca. Fresco bono, generally called as fresco, is a technique where you apply color on a wet plaster surface. You first apply a heavy layer of plaster on the wall, and while it is wet, you apply dry color pigment to it, just like the artists at Ajanta and Elora had done. Uh, the dry color is absorbed and that is one of the reasons why till date after so many years having been passed, till date those Ajanta and Elora paintings still survive because as the uh, upper layers kept on being scrapped off, the color has seeped into the plaster itself so it remains almost permanent. We find that even under the Mughals, uh, uh, you know, such type of paintings were being made on the walls. Then there was a stucco painting, uh, a slow setting, um, you know, paint on the plaster. There, it is not the dry plaster which is being applied. And lastly, you have murals, which is applying color directly on the surface of the store. So, I mean, uh, all type, all the three types of paintings were done by the Mughal artists on the uh, palace walls. And we would today be basically seeing some of the examples from Fatehpur Sikri. You know, if you go to the written records, you know, if you talk to any historian, he would say, uh, you know, history is when written records are present. And for everything for which we have no written records, it's prehistory. But everything cannot be written in word. Uh, if you look at all those tomes written under the Mughal period, there's hardly any explanation, uh, any uh, proper reference to how these paintings were being made. What were the uh, examples? We hardly get any information. The only example which we start getting would be if you go and study the wall itself. Uh, you know, Dasvant, uh, which uh, was one of the painters, a Hindu painter, uh, uh, he has been mentioned prominently by Abul Fazal in Aide Akbari. And about him, he says that he devoted his whole life to the art of painting and used for love of his profession to draw and paint figures even on the walls. I mean, we just saw a painting where there was a painter drawing a figure on the wall. So the same thing is being told to us by Abul Fazal that there are painters, for example, Daswant, 
who are indulging into these activities. And when Abul Fazal is men, uh, mentioning about the reign of Akbar, rest assured, he has Fatehpur Sikri in mind, the capital of Akbar's uh, you know, empire. Farid Bhakkari is another authority. He wrote during the reign of uh, Shah Jahan. He has uh, written the biographies of a large number of nobles. He mentions another wall painter, Abdus Samad. In one of the conversations, uh, which was being held between, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Mirza Aziz Koka, one of the nobles, and the son of Abdul Samad, uh, Mirza Aziz Koka reminds this son that all the paintings which were done in my palace on the walls were done by your father. Why don't you also start doing that? So we have another proper name who, were the, who, who was a wall painter during the period of uh, you know, Mughals. Uh, but when we mention Abdul Samad, naturally we are not uh, you know, mentioning him in context of Fatehpur Sikri because he existed much later. Coming to Fatehpur Sikri, uh, this is just a plan. Uh, of the various, you know, uh, palatial structures out there uh, with uh, popular names. I mean, if you go and see my book, Fatpur Sikri Revisited, uh, I challenge all those names which I have written out here. But I have given these names because it would be much easier for you to understand about which building we would ultimately be talking about. There are, I mean, almost... Uh, you know, uh, had you visited Fatehpur Sikri during the period reign of Akbar himself, perhaps not a single red sandstone would have been visible to you. You know, generally when today we visit Fatehpur Sikri, we say, oh, this red color is, you know, hurting our eyes with that, you know, sun shining on the top and red stone. Uh, I mean, it is uncomfortable. But during the reign of Akbar, perhaps each and every portion of the wall was painted over. Uh, these are the various palaces. Uh, for example, the palace here. Palace here. Hmm. These are some of the buildings which I have chosen, at, at least these three, which I have chosen uh, to show paintings from in today's talk. This building, if you look at here, this is the one. On the top is the Khwabgah, the bedchamber of the emperor. Right? Uh, what is visible? Red sandstone. Today, if you go there, uh, from the open courtyard, from the sunshine, you enter into the rooms, 90% uh, chances are that you won't be, unless someone points out to you, you would miss out the paintings. You won't be able to see them. Two reasons. One, because your eyes are not tuned to that. Number two, because of the efficiency of what we call as Archaeological Survey of India. Because uh, I am a witness to that. When I was writing my book and was visiting Fatehpur Sikri, uh, uh, some WHO organization had given them some asset to clean the walls. And uh, there was no supervisor and the, you know, mazdoors had just the bucket full of that asset and they were rubbing the paintings and uh, some of those paintings which I had recorded uh, uh, are now missing. Incidentally, these paintings which I am going to show to you were first recorded in 1895 by E.W. Smith. Uh, if you look, uh, see the book E.W. Smith's Fatehpur Sikri, you would find uh, some sketches and some in color photographs which are there. In 1995, I took up the task to photograph 
and visit those paintings once again. So some of those which had been hidden under the lime plaster applied on top of them during the British period, which made them inaccessible to Smith. But now because that lime plaster uh, that uh, was gone, I could record them. But all those which Smith had seen, by now they had decayed, uh, decayed much. So, but if you join my survey photographs and those of Smith, you have the entire set which was there at Fatehpur Sikri. Uh, uh, in the room below Khwabgah, uh, the, 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 the chamber on the top, just below that there is a big hall and on its walls and on its ceilings. I am giving you only a few examples of beautiful flowers. Some of them of Indian origin and some flowers like tulips, which have been drawn. I mean, it's very difficult to even photograph them because it's, uh, they are mostly in red color on red sandstone so it gets very difficult for you to actually capture them in such a condition still. Uh, the, the, uh, these are within that. And then on this chamber, uh, these are some of the paintings which were recorded by Smith, where you find an angel with a baby. Perhaps this is the uh, you know, myth of Mughal origin, the myth of Alan Khoa. You know, Abul Fazal talks about it. When he is talking about Akbar's sovereignty, he mentions that Akbar is a divine king. Why is he divine? Because he is from the line of Changez. And who is Changez? Changez's grandmother, Alan Khoa, was impregnated by the divine light. And just like Mother Mary, she got impregnated and gave birth to three sons, God sons, just like Jesus Christ. Three sons who had a mother, but God was the father. And so, from one of those sons, Changez was born. So now Changez had the right to be the ruler because he was a divine king, he was the son of the God himself. And what about the sons of the other two brothers? They were to be ministers. Mm. Uh, they would also be having something or the other. But kingship would be uh, in the hands of Changez and his family. And Abul Fazal writes that, you know, that divine sperm which had impregnated Alan Kwa, womb to womb got transferred into the womb of Akbar's mother and his lordship Akbar was born. Perhaps it was that divine theory which was being shown here by the artist in the form of an angel. Remember, when you look at European art, an angel is always in the form of a cherubim, a child. In Persian art, the angel is fully grown but generally in the form having feminine features. Beautiful, with wings. That is the way. And then uh, Smith also records another painting. Uh, what is that? Uh, I don't know. But uh, there is nothing angelic about this figure at all. Uh, I don't know, but uh, it was discovered by uh, Smith on the walls of the Khwabga, the bedchamber of the emperor. Another, uh, you know, painting, which was uh, found by Smith, uh, was in a much better form. You can see his sketch. There is a actually uh, a divine figure something like an idol, uh, much more in the Buddhist tradition, 
although remember that during akbar's period there was no trace of buddhism in india uh, abul fazal or anybody uh, none of akbar's period or during the mughal period mentioned buddhism at all because buddhism was not known jains are mentioned other sects are mentioned buddhism is not mentioned but this figure reminds you of buddhist figures and then there are other i mean then there is a very gory scene uh, mutilated bodies was it a depiction where he is trying to show that the idol worshippers have now been subjugated i don't know but what uh, actually surprises me is that such a you know gory scene is in a place where the emperor used to sleep what is the actual meaning of this scene i may not be able to inform you about but when i started my own you know uh, recordings this is what i found there now pay attention to this figure this is how smith had depicted it and this is what i find here i'll ask you to pay attention uh, perhaps it's not clear from where you are sitting it's a noble man with a halo around his face i'll show you another one uh, i mean these are the mutilated parts i am i am just uh, i want you to concentrate on this you see this golden halo are you able to make it out huh? uh, around the turban of the person if you ask any scholar of painting mughal painting they would say that halo reappeared in mughal art only from the period of jahangir but i found that it was there uh, in fatehpur sikri which has nothing to do with jahangir you may say that because the town was flourishing under jahangir as well it's quite possible that he might have got it repainted but then uh, we have another painting uh, it's not very clear this is the clearest one which survives now it has now disappeared thanks to our uh, you know uh, aga khan friends uh, at humayun's maqbara they renovated it removed the uh you know original plasters uh, repainted it uh, made it beautiful uh, actually i was looking forward to have ratish tandal in this program with me uh, uh, the original has disappeared the only record is this you see this man with a beard and a halo uh, with sun rays and this photo was taken by abacosh and uh, unfortunately the uh, perhaps at the time when she had taken her camera was not good or it was already so decayed that that th this is the only image and this painting is also dated to the period of akbar and so now we have two examples one at fatehpur sikri with the halo golden halo and another the only difference between the two is that here it is in a typical european fashion uh, with you know sun rays coming uh, uh, out of it instead of just there being a desk around it incidentally a large number of you know uh, paintings including on the walls survive which show us that a large number of christian themes were made by the moguls in their monuments generally it is said that it was during the reign of jahangir that european influence on mughal miniatures uh, was there very much and it was during that period that the large number of christian themed paintings were made so i am starting with that but i just showed that there was one painting from akbar's period also uh, uh, with uh, certain similar features now uh, perhaps uh, you would be seeing the entire image in the next lecture with jahangir uh, being entertained by noor jahan begum in one of her gardens 
and it is with the help of this particular painting that historians have identified the Bagh garden of uh, uh, Noor Jahan at Agra. It still survives. It is there. Now it is known as Aram Bagh. Because in popular legend, it was thought that this garden was of Babar. And perhaps the garden where after Babar's death, he was temporarily buried and that where uh, he performed Aram. Hmm. So uh, uh, it became in popular legend Aram Bagh and then through popular usage the A got best. It is now Ram Bagh. Hmm. So today if you go to Agra, you will find Ram Bagh out there and it survives. If you pay attention to the upper part of the paintings, there are certain figures out here. Might not be clear there, but would be much more clearer here. Jesus and Mary. During one of my surveys at uh, this particular spot, uh, when I went there, there was this white lime plaster all over the walls. So my photographer, the uh, part of my team uh, who had go gone along with me, told me, sir, uh, you know, uh, if you apply water, this lime mortar would become translucent. Perhaps something would appear from what is below it. So I said, OK, let's experiment. We uh, brought a bucket full of water. So one man threw it, and for a few seconds, a painting came out. So then what we did was that we brought another bucket of water. The tripod was fixed. The cameraman stood with his you know, focus on that particular wall. I counted one, two, three. The bucket threw her through the water. The cameraman clicked, and the result was this. One, a figure of an old man with a beard and the figure of a lady. Now that plaster has been revealed and if you go to Aram Bagh now, the ASI has cleared it up and you can see the image of the bearded man who appears to be like Jesus Christ and the other of Mother Mary with a, you know, a white wheel, a red a tunic and sitting uh, in a posture just like Mother Mary is generally shown, just like here. You see the red color tunic which she is wearing? Here the color is survived. In Lahore, Lahore Fort, uh, Jahangir's quadrangle, once again you have the figures of Christian themes. The, but the first image of that type were encountered at Fatehpur Sikri, which I had shown earlier to you. There is another building at Fatehpur Sikri. Uh, again, appears barren, but inside, in the veranda, you have the entire, you know, painting still surviving. You see, this is what E. W. Smith had found. Uh, we would focus here. Here it's a scene where Mother Mary is sitting. In front of her, an angel, peacock, uh, and then uh, a procession, polo being played, palace complex. It still survives. Uh, must not be clear to you from here. Uh, you know, uh, a woman in white dress, white gown, with an angel figure standing before her. Peacock is still visible in this painting, though might not be visible to you from far off. Elephants, processions coming out of the palace, polo match being played, they are all there still. If you go, I think it would be better from, uh, I mean, uh, you won't be able to understand it from the photograph. It is much more better visible if you see it with your own naked eyes.
is still surviving. You can see here, this is how Smith had shown Mother Mary being seated with angels standing before her. This is the peacock. And here you can still make out the same figure. Perhaps might be visible to you. Hmm? Uh, just on the opposite wall, again, angels being depicted. You can still see the wings. Other things have disappeared. You can see the wings. So difference between what Smith had found and what I could locate, but still the traces of what Smith had seen are still there on the site. On the pillars, very interesting theme which has been, it's a narrative just like a comic. You know, if you start from pillar one and end till pillar the last, there is an elephant fight which is being depicted. How two elephants are tied at two different corners, then their mahouts release them, they start the fight, they are, you know, engaged with each other, and then ultimately the imperial elephant wins, the other falls. The entire story, just like in a comic book, is still surviving in fragments on the walls of Fatehpur Sikri. Look here. Just a few of them I am showing. Hmm? Uh, Smith could still read what was written here. The tracing of the writing is still visible, but uh, uh, it's not very clear. You can make out something is written in Persian, but Smith has given the text that Pratapa, the royal elephant, was able to roast the enemy elephant which belonged to a noble. And what a great fight it was. Hmm. So, the, it, the entire story, just like in a comic book, ends with the victory of the uh, imperial elephant. Not only Christian themes and uh, general palatial scenes and fights and polo matches, but a lot of, you know, Hindu gods and goddesses and depictions are also there on the walls of Fatehpur Sikri, Akbar's palace you see the temple. This is how the sketch was given by Spit. It still survives. The photograph taken by me. A temple scene. In the palace where Akbar would be sitting himself. I'm sorry I'm taking much of your time. I'm just... Uh, then, uh, which god or goddess it is, I don't know. But to me it appears just like it is Ganesha with a pot belly. Might be someone else, I am no expert of that. But on, in the same palace, you have got this, uh, you know, uh, uh, a figure. Remember that in Islam, uh, life cannot be depicted, number one. Number two, it is impossible to de depict human being. Hmm. Chalo, kabhi kabhi animals dikha diya aapne, but never a man or a woman should be depicted because it would be tantamount to idol worship, classical religious Islam. But in Akbar's palaces, in each and every place, you will find the human figure being drawn, even gods and goddesses being drawn. Within the uh, building itself, uh, where Akbar used to sit, we have on the walls big portraits. This is a portrait of a woman. Uh, not very clear to you from there. Yeah, you can see the close-up of the face. Mm, wearing, you know, a sort of a headgear. Mm, you can uh, see her eyes. Right? Uh, Father Monzeret, the Jesuit priest who visited the court of Akbar, informs us, and his book is uh, published, Remonstrati, is, it's available perhaps within this library itself. You can go and check it up, whether I am speaking lies or 
uh, whether it's there or not. Monserrat says that once he was invited by Akbar one day uh, to his palace. Mm. Come and meet me. So he enters into a room. He says when he entered he found Akbar sitting uh, in the middle of the room having food. And he asked Monserrat, you come and join me. And Monserrat says that on the walls all around there were big portraits, one of Abraham, one of Moses, and the way he writes. He says that Akbar pointed out, this is Abraham, this is Moses, this is this, this is this, and that is Muhammad. So that was Monserrat's way of saying that Akbar is, you know, uh, getting alienated from Islam, how he mentions Muhammad. M importance is not that. Importance is that there were portraits built on the walls and we do find in the same palace uh, at least one or two portraits still surviving. Uh, 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 Manzaret was talking about prophets. Here we find a female, uh, whatever it is. There is another female. Then, you can see here, a man with a beard, white turban. I'm sorry, the slides are not good. Uh, and the slides are not good because the paintings are in the same way on the wall itself, so I can't help it. If you go to Jama Masjid, of Fatehpur Sikri, there those such type of depictions which we have been seeing so far are not there. It's only, uh, it's a religious place. So here you have floral designs, floral patterns, geometrical patterns. And you can also discern that perhaps they were painted over paintings. There was, there is an inner layer and then there is a addition to that from the top. So Jama Masjid is a place which kept on functioning as a mosque, live mosque, over a long period of time. So perhaps paintings were repainted and then repainted at Jama Masjid and still you will find uh, at each nook and corner uh, beautiful paintings, but none of them of animal or human figure, only geometrical and floral patterns. But then along with Akbar's, uh, you know, paintings and Akbar's, uh, you know, uh, buildings, I, I mentioned to you when I was starting that there is also a palace at Fatehpur Sikri which can be identified as the palace of Shah Jahan. I got a reference uh, of that palace in the Pachanama of Varis. Varis mentions that in such and such year, his Majesty Shah Jahan ordered the construction of a palace at Fatehpur Sikri at a place not far from the Jama Masjid overlooking the lake. So it had enough information for me to go and check that particular location. And at that particular location we found a big palace, but it was a palace which had to be dug out during excavations. Only portions of that were uh, uh, at the ground level. There are, there are certain subterraneous underground chambers which are below the ground. There are a number of things, but it's an entire palace and they can be actually dated to Shah Jahan's period because of the type of paintings and works which have been done on that. I mean, architecture can also reveal the date of a building. What type of arches what type of construction, what type of material. Remember that this type of painting, Carvo in that intaglio, which is, you find at Taj Mahal. You will say where, where in Taj Mahal? On the two structures, on the sides of the uh, pearly tomb, you find two red sandstone structures, one the mosque, the other the Mehman Khana, you enter, you will find that there is carvo intaglio. What is carvo intaglio? What you do is 
that you apply one set of color on the plaster or surface. Say for example, you applied white color. Let it dry. After it had dried, then you apply the second color, say red. And then when both these pl plasters have dried up, then you take a scraper, make a design and start scrapping the upper portion, the upper plaster. And then you burnish it and you get designs in two colors, the uh, lower uh, white and the upper red now intermingle with each other and result in such paintings. It was a typical, you know, art which was uh, prevailing during the period of Shah Jahan. And in this particular building, we start getting such medallions, such decorations. You see the medallions on the uh, inner side of the dome. I am just giving one example. I have just picked out one of them. And then uh, on these, you know, arches. And then in a subterraneous chamber, an underground chamber. You know, I, I was in fact told not to enter it because uh, it is a place of a bhoot. Hmm. Uh, so the villagers told me, no, karib mat jana ya jo jata hai wapas nahi aata hai. Maine kaha, tum gaye ho? Koi gaya hai? Tumhe khandan ka. Bola ne, bakariyaan gai hai nahi. Or wapas nahi hai haan se. So uh, what we did was that uh, uh, we went near it and we found that there was an opening, a Raushandan. And uh, uh, from which when we peeped, then it was a chamber within the ground. We, we somehow jumped into it. Uh, and uh, when we jumped into it, there were a lot of cobras. Uh, and on, at one corner, there was a python, hmm, a big python. And our, near the python, there were the bones of those goats which he had once consumed, giving the legend that. When we actually started looking at this from inside, all the walls were decorated in this carbo-integral pattern. I'm just showing one example, the dado of this subterraneous chamber, which is also at Fatehpur Sikri. Uh, look at the detail of this. Uh, on the walls, on the ceilings. What I tried to do today was very simple. Tell you that Mughal pa uh, painters, paintings, wall paintings are not about Mughals, the foreigners. They were not foreigners. They were as good as you and me. During that period, there was no nation, no concept of nation. Koi bahar ka nahi tha, koi andar ka nahi tha. Shivaji was not fighting Aurangzeb that because he was a foreigner or a Muslim, even Shivaji's commander was a Muslim. Shivaji was fighting Aurangzeb because Aurangzeb was a conqueror who was trying to capture his kingdom. The fight was between two kings. It was not a fight between one religion or the other and that is what I tried to demonstrate that in the palace of one of the kings who is now under dispute, Akbar, if you look at the walls, the walls tell you that that was a period which was made by both Hindus and Muslims together. Thank you very much. Mughal palaces, uh, we don't see partition walls, so they didn't have any concept of those walls or they used only curtains or? Uh, well, uh, thank you for this question. One more question. Uh, in Fatehpur, Sikri, there are, uh, and even in Delhi, there are Lal Kila, there are hollow walls and then the paintings. So the, the, was there not a question of uh, or problem of uh, water seepage? I didn't get your hollow, hollow walls for air conditioning? Okay, okay. Uh, you know, I would uh, 
Uh, are Sarbaya people listening? You will have to invite me for a second lecture uh, because both these questions relate with architecture. Hmm, right. But I will uh, answer you. Your uh, second question on hollow walls was uh, for uh, the purpose of insulation. Uh, most of the palaces of the Mughals not only had hollow walls, but even their floorings were partially hollow and below the floors there were channels, funnel, funnel shaped channels which were running. Uh, I mean uh, this uh, you know uh, creation of a hollow within the wall uh, you know absorbed the heat so much so that that if today you go to Fatehpur Sikri or to Agra Fort or to Delhi Fort any of those forts uh, it, you know, Delhi and Agra and Sikri, they are extremely hot places. But as soon as you would enter into the building, uh, it would appear that you are uh, under uh, uh, air conditioner. You, so, uh, you see, uh, number one, it was because of that. And because the walls were quite thick, uh, they were uh, more than two meters thick. Uh, so there was no question of there being any seepage. There were solid, uh, you know, uh, stones as layered with red sandstone. So there, there was no question of uh, that being there. What was your first question? I'm sorry. Uh, partition walls in the palace. Uh, yeah. Uh, you see, if you uh, look at uh, the... Uh, well, let me answer it this way. All of, all of us must have seen uh, Mughal Azam. Yes. Mm. Big halls. I mean, uh, you remember the place where Anarkali is dancing and uh, Shish Mahal and such high ceilings. They are all colonial buildings. Mm. During the Mughal period, there was no concept of rooms being used for living purposes. If you go to Fatehpur Sikri, for example, you would find uh, what in today's Hindi we would say coterie, blind rooms, no window, just a few doors, dark. And one imagines how would one be living in this. Those chambers were actually used for storing purposes. The actual living was in the baramda, verandas, hmm? dalan. And that is why you would find that in their architecture, there would be an enclosed chamber where you put all your things, but you pass your time in that veranda-like thing, which is open from uh, the front and from the sides. And then you have those uh, awnings which protect you further from the sun. It was, uh, you know, a derivation of their early peripatetic life. If you look at the tent camps, actually if you read Abul Fazal in original, you will find that even the names of those buildings now in stone are actually the names of structures which were once part of the moving camp. I just show you the, uh, showed you the Khwabga. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, sir, I'm taking a um, few minutes of yours more. Hmm. Uh, you must have seen it if you have gone to some hill station, um, how people live, that they have, you know, uh, structures which are raised on the top with cattles being tied in the uh, ground floor, they're living on the top for security purposes. Now, the same type of tents were there in the Mughal encampments when they were on the move. They were, in fact, replicated when the stone structures were made. Had we been talking about you know, uh, giving a lecture on architecture, I would have pointed out that sometimes those, you know, uh, um, stone buildings, they did not need a bracket. Bracket was needed only in, uh, you know, wooden structures. But the Mughal architect, in order to invoke the past, 
would add those brackets of stone so that the person living inside would still have the feeling as if he is living like Amir Taimur. Hmm. Right. So uh, there is no, uh, uh, number one, no concept of room. They are living in the open, open air. Uh, the double walls throughout because th that provides insulation. Uh, under the floors, you have, uh, you know, uh, a pipeline. During the winters, you light a fire and it would be heating up the entire chamber. During the summers, you have cold water which is flowing uh, within, cooling the room. That was how the structures. In fact, even in the uh, nobles' houses which we excavated at Fatehpur Sikri, not the imperial structures, even the nobles' houses, the same type of you know architecture was encountered. A uh, quick uh, question. Most of those uh, Christian theme paintings were a consequence of the colonial Portuguese influences or they predate that? Or? Do they predate that? Well, there are, I mean, uh, there are certain historians like Abakosh uh, who always tries to uh, look at European influences. You know, if you read the book, uh, um, Mughal Architecture by Abakosh, you will find that uh, everywhere there are parallels drawn to Western art. Uh, right. That might be one of the reasons. Uh, no one can deny it. But uh, I would like to submit that as far as the Islam of that period is concerned, even uh, in Islam, uh, the Christian figures, especially Jesus and Mary, they are sacred fi uh, figures, only next to the Prophet himself, right? And they are, I mean, uh, the Muslims would not consider them to be son of God. But for example, Mary is uh, the most pious woman who would be getting a special place in heaven as per the Quran. Uh, if you look at Fatehpur Sikri, you would find that the, 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 the legends of Jesus and Mary are being repeatedly uh, I mean, uh, depicted not only on the walls through paintings, but also through verses. Quranic verses which praise these figures have been, you know, carved on the walls. So perhaps I think, uh, you know, every politician is a, basically a politician. I'm not uh, saying that I must not blame Ab Akbar. He might also be playing politics. Uh, he's dealing with Jesuits and others in the court. Uh, you know, by 1580s is a period when he's getting in constant contact with these Jesuits and others. He has to win them over. He has this problem that uh, the Mughal ships have to buy a katas, you know, to go to Hajj. So he has to placate them as well. So it's also possible that some calibration at a higher level might have been done because of their presence, right? But the mere fact that, uh, you know, Christian themes are being invoked in uh, Muslim buildings is no surprise. More surprising is the depiction. I have not shown you the sculptural part of it. There, are, uh, th there is, in fact, a, a sculpture which still survives in the same palace where Mother Mary in, uh, is being depicted, there is a sculpture of Ram and Hanuman on one of the brackets at Fatehpur Sikri. 90% of us who visit there miss it. It's very much there. I'm sorry I forgot to uh, show you that. Uh, but you know, that is more surprising in a way, rather than uh, being surprised if we find the Christian themes on uh, the, 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 these uh, Mughal buildings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At the fag end when his son was under rebellion. Um, sir, I'd also like to ask a question about the depiction of the Christians. 
um, from what I saw here, they were very reminiscent of Greek and Roman uh, faces and bodies. Because even uh, now when you see sculptures or um, the way uh, Romans are depicted, they're always very muscular and they have a muscular torso. And when Greeks are depicted uh, from ancient times, they always have a bit of a beard and that kind of look. Uh, so when I saw these, I immediately thought of those. So I just wondered if those were the Christians that were thought of in that period. Uh, perhaps, but perhaps not. Yeah, uh, you see, the thing is that, uh, yes, uh, the Mughals were exposed to uh, Christian art. And Christian art itself derived much from the Greeks. There is no doubt about it. Uh, but then you have that uh, um, Bhartiya um, uh, emblem with those lions uh, from Ashoka's period, typically Greek style, right? So th those influences have been there in the art. Uh, I can only say this much, that the Mughals themselves were not exposed directly to the Greek art, but perhaps through the European contacts and through the European paintings were, which were being brought to the court. I must also inform you that sometimes, both under Akbar and more under Jahangir, whenever those paintings were brought by any of those you know, uh, European visitors to the court, uh, sometimes the emperor would ask to boast in front of the European emissary, ask his painter to make a shabi of that. And then claim that, you see, this shabi is better than what you had brought. Right. So what is actually happening is that whatever art was being brought and presented to the emperor, even the artist is getting exposed to that. And ultimately, he is learning something new. Also remember that under Akbar, the uh, miniatures, if you look at the miniatures, they are um, not three-dimensional. There is no, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, everything is very flat. No shading, no perspective. You know, if you have to depict something which is near, middle, and, you know, far, so you make three separate, you know, columns and depict them, all being equal in size to each other. It was only after the European uh, influence started coming in that both the, uh, in the coloring, that shading was started being given so that a three-dimensional effect should enter. And secondly, that perspective that whatever is far, afar should be smaller, hazier than what is uh, closer uh, uh, to the artist. See, so these influences were definitely European influences, and it is quite possible that what you are talking about was also entering the Mughal art through the same route. Right, sir? Building the there was a water pump system without electricity, and uh, later on it was uh, destroyed. So there was a what? Water water pump system. Right. Uh, and uh, on the back side of the um, uh, palace, mm. and, and that is destroyed mm. after that. Mm. Just to find out how they how they did it. <laughs> uh, well, so, uh, again, sir, my pay attention. <laughs> uh, well. Uh, you see, uh, there is something which Babar mentions, and that is the Sakya, the Persian wheel. Uh, uh, it was, uh, you know, a pin drum gearing mechanism, hmm. where the vertical and horizontal motion simultaneously with the additions of grooves and chains uh, were being uh, accomplished. And Babar mentions that when he came to Punjab, uh, that, uh, you know, uh, Persian wheels with pin, pin drum gearings were uh, supplying constant water 
uh, to the peasants so much so that that uh, certain communities of peasants which were very lower in origin ultimately gained uh, much respectability because they were able to get wealth. Now it is this Persian wheel, Sakya, which was applied during the uh, pre-modern period uh, to maintain a constant supply of water. And at Fatehpur Sikri, there are at least two spaces, the two main water works, the southern water work and the northern water work. And at both the places, the water, actually it was the lake, which was supplying subterraneous water to the territory because now the uh, lake was regulated, it became a constant feature. B before that, it was perennial, but Akbar uh, draw sluices and whatnot, and there was constant supply, so much so that, that now near the palace, below the ridge, there was much uh, uh, water available uh, under the surface. They would dig wells, and in these wells, they would place a series of wells, one on top of other, Near Hatipol, there are uh, five series of, you know, uh, Persian wheels which were placed one top of the other with, uh, you know, artificial wells being created uh, at higher levels. So much, uh, so much so that that ultimately the fifth Persian wheel would be lifting the water to the top of the palace complex, and then even the fountains would be working as if it's a. Uh, I mean, a, a stream is supplying the water. And the same mechanism is found in the northern water works, and, and it is uh, through that, that the entire, not only the palatial complex, the entire city was getting, because there are, you know, um, hundreds of hammams, not only the imperial ones, but also those associated with the noble and common men's houses, which had hammam, in which there was a constant supply of water through the same mechanism. Thank you. Uh, we'll uh, move on to the rest of the questions. But at the end of the session, thank you. Have... Subscribe to Sarmaya and be a part of the stories and conversations around art, history and culture.